All right, this next video continues our journey to track Buddhism through different areas in Asia. We're now moving past China into Korea and Japan. So just looking at this map, you can see how Buddhism is moving from uh, its founding location along in northern India, along the border of India and Nepal, and then moving into China, and then into Korea, and then into Japan. Of course, also moving into Afghanistan, where we saw those Bamiyan Buddhas, and also down into uh, Burma and down into Southeast Asia. So the focus, as I said, is Korea and Japan for today. Uh, thinking about Korea to start, we're going to start off looking at the Three Kingdoms period, which ranges, which is a long period where you have uh, three powerful groups, uh, the Shilla, which we'll be focusing on mostly, the Pakje and the Gregorio. So you can see these different territories here. You can see that connection to China very closely linking uh, northern Korea to China and so obviously there would be a lot of influence there and then just an overall map to orient you. So our first key work thinking about Buddhism in Korea is to look at the Bodhisattva Maitreya, uh, this representation of a pensive Bodhisattva. We see a figure who seems to be in a state of thinking, of course. So this figure has uh, the leg across the lap and then the finger at the jaw. And so you have this wonderful pensive expression. You have a lotus crown. Uh, the figure is relatively large, 37 inches inches and it is gilded so it is a luxurious object uh, you have that sense of the lotus throughout with indications down here at the base and then as I mentioned with the crown um, but just a kind of soft sweetness to this figure there's a smoothness to the body that we've seen before so thinking about how styles from India went into China and then are starting to be adopted and changed as we move into Korea we can see those indications of a future Buddhahood with the long earlobes, and then also the fact that the dress is not super, uh, super luxurious. So we do see some princely elements here, but not to the point of being too over the top, and the feet, I believe, are bare. So um, some simplicity here as well, but just a lovely, very sweet, meditative figure, um, a, a Buddha of the future. So moving into the unified Shilla Kingdom, this is where you have the one Shilla Kingdom become dominant throughout the Korean Peninsula, and they were assisted by Tong China. So we talked very briefly in the last video about how Tong China is going to become this very important international power and this important unifying force in China, but then also has this international strength. And so through assistance from Tong China, the unified Shilla Kingdom becomes quite strong um, for slightly less than 300 years. So one of the things we see is this continued interest in uh, creating Buddhist images and also using really luxurious objects to create those Buddhist images, uh, luxurious materials. So in this case, we see a work, um, an Amitabha Buddha, or in Korean, Amita Buddha, um, this Buddha of the pure land of the Western paradise, this Buddha that provided a slightly easier route by praying to this Buddha um, of reaching paradise after, after life. In this particular case, we see these figures who, um, or these figures are using um, really valuable materials. So remember those gold crowns from the early burials in Korea from the Wangnam De Chong from the burials in Gyeongju, now we're seeing that luxurious gold being used to create Buddhist images. So we see, even though very, very small, this ultra luxurious image of uh, the Amitabha Buddha. So you can see the flower behind, the kind of flaming mandorla that we've noted before that probably came in through China. So that influence of that flaming mandorla, the lotus blossom down below. This wonderful interest in drapery that we'll continue to see not only in Korea, but also in Japan. So please definitely keep an eye on that. Um, so we sometimes call this waterfall drapery because it looks almost like waterfall coming down. And if we switch back to that Bodhisattva Maitreya, that pensive Bodhisattva, you see also that wonderful interest in drapery with those waterfall effects that drape down. So just a lovely example of a very luxurious figure um, using that gold. So rather than using it for burial, now it's being used for Buddhism. And in addition to that, you can also see the Tang Dynasty influence on this Buddha. So we had talked about how in Tong China, the faces tend to get fuller and they get these rolls around the neck. Um, so you can see that fuller body, the rolls around the neck and the fuller face with that influence coming from Tong China. 
One of the most famous structures that survives from this period uh, that is a Buddhist structure is a cave temple. And so we've talked about caves in this class before, in these videos before. So we looked at the caves at Ajanta in India. We saw some of the caves at Bamiya in Afghanistan. Um, we looked at the Mughal caves at Dunhuang in China. And so here we're seeing a cave that actually is uh, similar in some ways, but is much more kind of more detailed and carefully put together. So it's very much this kind of intricate construction project. So you can see these individual blocks to build up the the dome that goes over the Buddha that is at the center of this cave. So here I'm showing you some exterior exterior views and then also showing you a view, um, an aerial view and then an elevation of the structure itself. But let's go inside and see how this one was created. Um, so in this particular case, we can see that historical Buddha or possibly the Varochana, the, the transcendent or cosmic Buddha, more this generative force of the Buddha. And so we see two guardian attendants on either side here and here, or actually these are probably more kind of ferocious figures that are warding off evil from the Buddha. And then there are bodhisattvas along the inner portion here. You can see how the stonework is incredibly detailed. And so as we go into Korea and Japan, Buddhism was just very appealing to an intellectual upper class. It provided great comfort, um, but also it had a certain amount, or obviously it had written sutras, and so there was this element of intellectual appeal for a literate group uh, who was look, who were looking for uh, religious traditions to follow. And so obviously we can see this was made by a patron who was an individual of great wealth. It's generally understood to be Kim Tae-sung, who was a prime minister, um, who created it as a wish to, to honor his royal ancestors. And so this also shows the traditions of uh, Confucianism of Confucian beliefs being brought into Korea as well and the, the idea that even though Buddhism is there now you still have this continuing influence of other philosophies and other traditions as well. So this is called um, Sigorum, this cave, and uh, we're very lucky that it survives. It's obviously about 1300 years old and there is this debate. It's you know, probably the historical Buddha, but it could be this transcendent Buddha, the Virachana Buddha. Uh, and it's near Gyeongju, the site where we saw some of the burials a few videos back. The Buddha at center is very much that Tong Dynasty style, so a fuller figured Buddha, fuller face, some of those rings around the neck, and uh, definitely showing that influence of Tong China. There we see the Buddha again, and again coming from the 8th century. So you can see the detail of the dome, this capstone, which does have a crack in it, um, but just the detail of putting this together and uh, how complex it would have been and again how expensive it would have been. The Buddha itself for the urna, the third eye, actually has a crystal and so if the door to the cave is left open, light enters in, illuminates the space, illuminates the Buddha, and of course would also illuminate the crystal, really enlivening the Buddha. And there was always this sense of how to enliven the image and so often there were ideas of the Buddha having its eyes opened right before a Buddha was um, put into place and, and put into a system of worship, um, but also this idea of how do you make it look more lively, and in this case, incorporating that crystal and light effects would have helped to do that. So again, bodhisattva surrounding, um, you can see the detail of the curls in the hair, again, an interest in drapery, although in this case, much lighter, and then a lotus pedestal down below. We're going to move on to Japan and see some of the early Buddhist structures and sculpture uh, in Japan. So we're going to start off with the Asuka period and then move on to the Nara period. So the Asuka period goes from 552 to 645. Um, Buddhism was introduced to Japan by a mission from Korea in 552. Um, an image of the Buddha along with sutras were presented to an emperor. Uh, the emperor was the father of Empress Suiko, who was really instrumental in getting Buddha going in Japan. So Empress Suiko lived from 554 to 628 and Prince Shotoku lived from 574 to 622 and he became probably the more famous of the two for his influence in establishing Buddhism in Japan. So Suiko was referred to as Suiko Tenno and Tenno means supreme ruler in Japan. So many people debate because she was a woman how much influence she would have had. Um, did her nephew Prince Shotoku actually have more influence 
influence. However, we do think that she had great influence. Uh, we do think she was widely respected. It seems like a lot of important political and military events happened under her rule, and so she must have had a good amount of power to make these things happen. So Prince Shotoku's importance reached mythical proportions, as I said, and cults were dedicated to him. So there's now this debate as to how much of it is true. However, there is uh, a firm belief that both uh, Empress Shotoku or Empress Suiko and Prince Shotoku were very influential in establishing um, a particular Buddhist site, which I'm going to show you in just a second. All right, there we go. So this is Horyuji uh, in Nara or in the Nara prefecture, and this is the western sector. There's also an eastern sector that has a nunnery in it. So this complex was or originally built in 607, so near the end of the lives of both Empress Suiko and Prince Shotoku. Um, it burned down in 670. It is a wood structure, and so obviously that would be of great concern um, for any wood structure which we tend to see in East Asia this great concern for fires um, so this did burn down in 670 however it was rebuilt or excuse me it was rebuilt in the late 7th century so shortly after it burned down in 670 it was rebuilt and it is the oldest extant wooden structure or wooden structures in the world which makes it quite exceptional so the entrance gateway is here. It is slightly off center, which many people discuss as indicating this preference for asymmetry that we often see in Japanese art. There's also a pagoda with um, five eaves right here, and then a golden hall or kondo right here, which features a lot of the images and statuary of the site. And so it is believed that Emperor Suiko and Prince Shotoku founded Horyuji in 607. Um, it's now believed that a lot of the histories have been exaggerated, as I've already mentioned, through myths and things like that. The uh, Kondo, as I said, features a lot of the images, and this pagoda is, again, that axis mundi. It has a jewel at the top featuring or uh, representing Buddhist wisdom, and those five tiers refer to the cosmos, which the, with the idea of the four cardinal directions, and then the idea of the zenith or apex on top. Uh, so this idea of four cardinal directions plus a top point. And inside the pagoda is a, re is a reference to the Paranirvana of the Buddha, or the idea of the death of the Buddha and his transition to Nirvana. So there's this wonderful mourning scene inside. Uh, not a key work, but if you're interested, you could look into that. I wanted to focus in on the Tamamushi Shrine. So the Tamamushi Shrine is this wonderful lacquer, uh, shri small shrine, relatively small, 92 inches, so fairly large in some ways, um, but originally it would have glimmered wonderfully covered in thousands of wings from Tamamushi beetles. And I'm just showing you a, one of these Tamamushi beetles in someone's hand here. Um, so you have to imagine it really iridescent and glowing and wonderful. Um, so it features images of attendants and guardians and monks worshipping relics, but it also has a wonderful story of a jataka, so I'll show you that in just a second. Um, but giving you that overall view of the shrine, of course it also indicates what architecture looked like at that time. We of course have the extant architecture from the late 7th century, um, but this is obviously a miniature version of the kind of architecture you would see in Japan at that time. The pedestal again refers to the lotus here. Um, lacquer, as we've seen in other videos, was, was very, very labor and intensive because you would take it from a certain kind of tree and you could only take so much sap without killing the tree. So really important to take only a little bit and so of course labor intensive, very expensive and would take a long time but it was a great way to preserve wooden structures. So here's the Jataka that I was referring to. It's the Jataka or Tale of the Hungry Tigress. So remember Jatakas were stories of the Buddha's previous lives and often had uh, connections to the Buddha making the ultimate sacrifice of offering his body or dying for others uh, and this idea of a belief that there was a better future through rebirth. So in this particular case we have a prince who has seen a mother tiger and her cubs and they're starving and so he removes his clothing which we see in this image here and then he dives from the cliff in what we would call in art history a continuous narrative, this idea that we're seeing the figure multiple times. And then um, his body comes down to the bottom here, and his body is being consumed by the tiger and her tiger cubs. And traditionally the idea or the story goes that the the prince offered his body to the tiger, but they're so weak from starving that 
they don't have any energy to tear his body apart. So he realizes he has to do the work for them. So that's why he's removing his garments and, and falling from this cliff so that his body is opened so that they can eat and they will be able to live. And it's interesting because there are a lot of stories in Japanese art that refer to this idea of hunger or starvation. And so I think this is a really nice idea that it's hinting to the suffering that many people faced and the idea that there wasn't always enough food to go around. Um, so this idea of hunger is something that we'll see in some other artwork. So please keep it in mind. Here are some of those other representations that I wanted to show you. So monks worshipping relics, also from the Tamamushi Shrine, and then guardian kings on the doors of the Tamamushi Shrine, and then bodhisattvas as well in that more princely garb. And so you get the sense of the kind of elegant dress that those in the upper classes probably wore. Um, remember that the bodhisattvas wore that more elegant and luxurious garb. Inside the Kondo, we encounter the Shaka Triad, um, which was commissioned and dated to just after when Prince Shotoku is recorded as dying and shortly before uh, Empress Suiko will pass away. So the Shaka Triad features the historical Buddha at center along with bodhisattvas on either side. We actually know the the individual who created this, so Tori Bushi. Um, Bushi just means maker of Buddhist images, and then Tori was a specific family, a, um, a workshop. It's relatively large, 69 inches, and you can see again those kind of flaming pointed mandorlas. So this idea of connecting back to some of the styles we saw in China previously, we see that wonderful waterfall drapery, and also these kind of fish style folds on the bodhisattvas at either side. You can see Buddhas of the past that are manifesting inside the mandorla. And many people comment on how these mandorlas seem kind of chaotic and complex and swirling and moving. And so this heightens the effect of the Buddha looking so calm at center. The Buddha has the have no fear gesture along with a welcoming gesture. So remember those mudras are carried into these other areas as well. Um, you can get a sense of the detail of the hair. Those kind of snail shell curls continue to be influential in other in other locations. So again, this is inside the condo, and so generally you can you can go in and see the images, although sometimes the doors are closed, sometimes the doors are open, so this idea of the images can be restricted if necessary. The pagoda is generally closed at Horyuji, um, although you can circumambulate to assist in meditation. I wanted to show you a few images of kanon or um, bodhisattvas of compassion. So in Sanskrit that would be Avalokiteshvara and then in Chinese it's Guan Yin. Um, kanon becomes a really popular bodhisattva because this is that bodhisattva of compassion and of course everyone wants compassion, that's always a good thing. Um, sometimes we see this bodhisattva gendered female and sometimes male. So just keep in mind that sometimes we'll see a more masculine version of kanon and sometimes more feminine, especially in China when we see the guanyin, it tends to be more feminine. Um, so this is a, a figure called the Yumidono kanon. It was inside of Yumi, the Yumidono pavilion, which means hall of dreams. And this figure holds um, a flaming jewel and then that fish folds that we tend to see again, that flaming kind of chaotic mandorla and then in addition to that some people have claimed that this could be a portrait of Prince Shotoku. Of course this cannot be confirmed uh, but that is one possibility. Let's move on to another kanon. This is called the Kudara kanon, a very elegant, very slender kanon. Again, you can see that interest in those kind of fish folds, although done more subtly here. You have this kind of swinging drapery that overlaps. Originally, this wooden sculpture would have been painted, so this image just gives you a sense of the vibrancy of the colors. Um, this close-up, you get a sense of the elegance of the carving and the detail of the carving. Unfortunately, a lot of it has been lost. It's a very very, very large, nearly seven feet tall, and obviously different um, from the Yumidono in the sense that this one was covered in gold leaf. So different overall effect, the gold leaf versus the color. Um, Kudara is named for a kingdom in, in Korea, so there was this idea that perhaps it was uh, given from Korea or, or originated in Korea and was brought to Japan, but we're just, uh, most people now think that it was probably made in Japan. 
Our last kanon, kanon is the Yumichigai Kanon or the Dream Changer Kanon. So again, just showing you the popularity of this idea of compassion. And I just think this one's really interesting because, so this one is made of bronze and it really connects back to traditions in India. So going all the way back to those styles we see there with the more fleshy bodies, the softer belly, um, that interest in texture. And so I just think we see really nice variety of artistic styles in those three different Kanon sculptures. So just to show you all three together, you can compare the three. All three could be find, found at Horyuji um, from around the same time, from that Asuka period. So just showing the kind of different styles that artists were exploring. If we go back to the Yumichi Gai, you can see that there is um, an Amida Buddha or Amitabha in Chinese, this Buddha of the Pure Land, uh, and so that's a way of recognizing a kanon is sometimes you'll see that image of the Buddha. Let's look at a few other temples, but now we're moving on to the Nara period. So we're looking at the Great Buddha Hall at Todaiji, which is the Great Eastern Temple in Nara. Um, this, however, experienced a lot of fires. It was rebuilt. Uh, the, the Buddha inside, this huge cosmic transcendent Buddha, has been uh, recreated due to fires, but it gives you a sense of the massive structures that start to be created as we move into this later period in Japanese history. The patron here was Emperor Shomu, so many of these rulers needed to think about the traditions of Shinto and then how are we going to incorporate Buddhism into those traditions. So there were sometimes kind of push and pull. The, the emperors still did claim that they were descended from Amaterasu, so um, this this goddess associated with the sun, who uh, all these emperors claimed connection to. So there's this whole idea of integrating these different beliefs or different traditions in Japan um, that was happening around this time. Uh, I wanted to show you Todaiji because it is a very famous site to visit today, a very popular site to visit uh, because it is one of these older temples or is in the site of one of these older temples and recreates one of these older temples. Also in the land around it, deer roam freely and you can feed them. And so many people who visit love to feed the deer. Apparently they're very aggressive, however, so you do need to be careful if you feed the deer. And of course this connects back to the idea that the Buddha gave his first sermon in a deer park going back to Sarnath. So we saw that in a previous lecture. So going inside the Great Buddha Hall, we can see the Buddha Roshana, or cosmic or transcendent Buddha, this Buddha that gives, that's generative. Um, you have that have no fear gesture and the welcoming gesture. You have images of Buddhas of the past that are behind the Buddha. And it's absolutely massive. It's 52 feet tall. You have those really defined snail shell curls. Um, when this temple was being built, it apparently nearly bankrupted the area. It took an incredible amount of resources and um, manpower to construct it. So just thinking about how how many resources people had to give to construct these types of things in the 8th century. Uh, so this one was last restored in 692. Again, this temple has suffered from a lot of fires. Uh, Every year in the summer, they do clean or kind of dust this Buddha. So there are some wonderful images online, if you're interested, uh, where you see these individuals who look so tiny and small as they go along uh, and dust the Buddha and clean the Buddha to make sure that it stays in good shape. At Todaiji, there's a lot of other structures. There's a lot of other different um, places that you can visit. So originally, if we go back to this image, you can see the two pagodas as well. So lots of things going on on this site. Um, but one thing that's there is called Shoso-in. So it was very often, very common to have a kind of treasury on these campuses or on these precincts. And so Shosoin holds over 9,000 luxury items. These are just a few examples and only a few are putting, are put on exhibit every year. But just the idea that even though Buddhism tended to avoid the idea of attachment and desire. It doesn't mean that these temple complexes didn't include luxurious items. So this is just an example from the site or from the structure called Shosoin at Todaiji. Okay, so our last temple to look at today is called Yakushiji. Um, it features a medicine Buddha. And so this was slightly before Todaiji. We have the Emperor Temu who um, built this in 680 to pray for his empress, Jito, to recover from an illness. She had an eye disease. And the ironic thing was that he actually died before she did. She recovered and she completed this 
this temple. Um, it also experienced fire, so much of what we're seeing has been rebuilt, but you can just get a sense of the hall that holds the images, the dual pagodas. This has a bit more symmetry to it, um, but again, the pagodas with that, that idea of the axis mundi that we've seen many times before. As we go inside, we can see the images, especially the image of the Yakushi Triad and the Medicine Buddha at center. And this triad, it's a very tight space inside this hall, so it's difficult to get photographs. But again, you can see these very luminous mandorlas behind. You can see the halos behind as well, um, images of the Buddha behind. But you have this Yakushi or Medicine Buddha, so it originally would have held a vessel for medical ointment in his hand. Um, you can see these figures on either side that again have this wonderful fleshy quality to them similar to that Yumichigai Kanon if we go back to that figure there. So I always think that the figures are somewhat reminiscent of the Yumichigai Kanon um, and this interest in a, a fleshier representation of the human form. Drapery remains significant so you can see those distinct drapery styles, lotus flowers at the base, and then if we zoom in, you can see um, the Yakushi, the, the medicine Buddha at center, large body, rolls around the neck, full face. So clearly we have a tongue style Buddha here, very defined snail shell curls, hanging earlobes, um, clear identifying features of the Buddha. Again, he would have held an, an ointment jar here. You can see those kind of waterfall drapery folds. And then he also has these animals on either on the sides of his throne, which are difficult to see, but there's a dragon on the east, a phoenix on the south, a tortoise on the north, and a tiger at the west. And these are all connected to Chinese Taoist traditions. So, so just showing how Chinese ideas are filtering into Korea and of course here in Japan. <clears throat> Here's another detail. I wanted to show the image with a lot of offerings around it. So it's very common if you go to a Buddhist temple that you would see a lot of um, flowers or sweets or other offerings being given to these figures. So in this case, you can get a much better sense of that. And then I also just wanted to show an image of the two Buddhas together. So this is from the Shaka Triad at Horyuji, the the oldest wooden structures in the world, the first temple that was commissioned by uh, Empress Suiko and Prince Shotoku. So you can see this nice, uh, pleasant smile, this welcoming smile, and then it becomes a bit more stern as we move into the Tong period. You can see the hairstyles are relatively similar, but the faces are quite different, and um, the overall body types are quite different. So just in a relatively short amount of time, you can see the strength of that Tong influence coming into Japan and incorporating it itself into the sculpture. So that's it for early Korea and Japan with Buddhism and in the next video we'll be moving on to painting and other and material culture as well uh, primarily in China and Japan. Thank you.